Hello, my name is Dr. Melanie Bourgeau. I am now a fourth year pathology resident at Emory University. And in this video, I'm going to be going over three soft tissue pathology cases, which I hope will provide a fun and interesting challenge for new trainees. If you would like to view any of these cases for yourself, you can find the links to the digital slides in the video description. This is a core biopsy of a rapidly growing soft tissue mass near the clavicle in a 23-year-old female. So at low power, the first thing I notice is reactive bone formation. Now you can distinguish this from mature bone by the lack of lamellae or lines as well as the haphazard arrangement and lack of well-formed bony trabeculae. And then surrounding that reactive bone is a variably cellular proliferation of stellate to spindle cells. You can see in some areas they're more collagenous with the cells arranged in short fascicles. And there are other areas that have a looser, more feathery arrangement within a myxoid background. Additional features I notice are some scattered inflammatory cells some small but reasonably prominent blood vessels, as well as some scattered multinucleated giant cells. The cells themselves appear relatively uniform, with an ovoid to cigar-shaped nucleus, central punctate nucleolus, and a moderate amount of amphiphilic cytoplasm. Now at first glance, you might think these cells look a bit weird, and that might make you worry about a sarcoma, such as osteosarcoma. However, you'll come to recognize that this pattern in morphology you see here is really characteristic of myofibroblasts. This is an example of myocytosalsificans, a benign myofibroblastic neoplasm that is part of the USP6 rearranged family of tumors, which includes, among others, nodular fasciitis and aneurysmal bone cyst. These are rare lesions and can occur over a wide age range, but are most common in young adult males. Myositis ossificans typically arises intramuscularly in areas prone to trauma, such as the thigh, elbow, and shoulder. They exhibit rapid growth and can be tender, which may raise the alarm for a malignant process. Imaging studies can be really helpful in these cases. Characteristically, you'll see a well-circumscribed lesion with a peripheral bony shell. However, this may not be present in some lesions, especially newer ones. Now, I admit, this one is tricky, especially on biopsy. But to give you a better sense of this entity, I'm going to show an excision specimen. The key feature here is zonation. At the periphery, we have the well-formed trabeculae of mature lamellar bone, and then moving in towards the center, this transitions into woven bone, with the center of the lesion being composed of this myofibroblastic proliferation. Some areas, like this one here, can be more cellular. However, other areas, like this one right here, have that loose tissue culture-like appearance, which can be seen in other USP6 rearranged tumors. This is a representative section of a large retroperitoneal mass abutting the pancreas of a 53-year-old male. At low power, I can see this is a relatively circumscribed mass, although there is some infiltration into the adjacent adipose tissue. Even at this low power, I can tell that this lesion is composed of markedly atypical cells, within a myxoid to fibrous stroma. Some areas, like here, the cells are embedded in a myxoid stroma with prominent vasculature. Other areas, like this one here, are more collagenous and hypercellular, and you can make out a vague fascicular arrangement. Looking more at the cells themselves, you can see that there's really a spectacular amount of atypia, with pleomorphism, hyperchromasia, irregular nuclear membranes, coarse chromatin, and even multinucleation. Mitotic figures, including the typical ones, are easy to find, such as this one right here. This is an example of well-differentiated liposarcoma. But before we get into that, let's talk about its well-differentiated counterpart. Here is an example of well-differentiated liposarcoma. Key features include lobules of mature but variably sized adipocytes separated by thick fibrous bands containing atypical stromal cells. Lipoblasts, like this one right here, may be present but are not required for diagnosis. 
These tumors commonly arise in the retroperitoneum and deep soft tissues of the extremities in middle-aged and older adults. Cases of well-differentiated liposarcoma arising in the extremities are called a typical lipomatous tumor due to their lower rate of dedifferentiation, which is thought to be as low as 2% in a typical lipomatous tumor and as high as 20% in well-differentiated liposarcoma. This lower rate of dedifferentiation ultimately results in a better prognosis, which is likely due to the fact that negative margins are easier to obtain. One variant of well-differentiated liposarcoma to be aware of is the sclerosing variant. As the name suggests, this subtype is composed predominantly of atypical cells within a collagenous to sclerotic stroma. The adipocytic component is often present, but usually scant. These lesions can be incredibly hypocellular, with the typical stromal cells being few and far between. Switching back to dedifferentiated liposarcoma, up to 90% of cases arise de novo, with the other 10% arising within a pre-existing well-differentiated liposarcoma. Just like well-differentiated liposarcoma, the most common sites are the retroperitoneum and the deep soft tissues of the extremities. In addition, both well-differentiated and dedifferentiated liposarcoma have amplifications of the 12Q13-15 through 15 region, which includes MDM2 and CDK4. The morphology of dedifferentiated liposarcoma is extremely variable, including within the lesion itself. This case here is an example of the high-grade myxofibrosarcoma-like morphology. Other patterns include morphology similar to undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, lyomyral sarcoma, and synovial sarcoma. Heterologous differentiation, such as osteosarcomatous or chondrosarcomatous differentiation, may also be present. Rarely, homologous differentiation can occur with areas resembling pleomorphic liposarcoma. However, Dedifferentiation is not always high grade with marked atypia, hypercellularity, and brisk mitotic activity. Some cases of dedifferentiated liposarcoma are deceptively bland, with relatively uniform spindle cells in a fascicular, story form, or whirling pattern. Low grade dedifferentiated liposarcoma may resemble a low grade spindle cell neoplasm, such as low grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, or even fibromatosis. Here is a nice example of low-grade dedifferentiation in a well-differentiated liposarcoma. On the left, you can see areas of clear well-differentiated liposarcoma, however, there is widening of the fibrous septa. On the right side, you can see a near-complete loss of the adipocytic component, accompanied by an increase in stromal cellularity. Before I wrap up this video, here are a couple of take-home points. First. Since the majority of retroperitoneal sarcomas are liposarcomas, it is essential to rule out dedifferentiated liposarcoma if you have a sarcoma in that location. Second, because it portends a worse prognosis, you must thoroughly evaluate cases of atypical lipomatous tumor and well-differentiated liposarcoma for foci of dedifferentiation. Because these tumors are usually quite large, proper sampling is important in identifying areas of suspicion. This is a painless, slow-growing mass on the finger of a 46-year-old female. At low power, we can see this is a multi-lobulated lesion with areas of dense fibrosis. Moving to higher power, we can see that these lobules are composed of sheets of epithelioid to plasmacytoid cells with round nuclei, prominent nucleoli, and a moderate amount of amphiphilic cytoplasm. Focal hemocytorin deposition is present, and the background is variably collagenous. In addition, there are also scattered multinucleated giant cells. Lastly, there are also areas composed predominantly of foamy histiocytes, like this area right here. This is an example of localized tenosynovial giant cell tumor, a benign soft tissue neoplasm which, as the name suggests, arises from the synovium and involves the tendon sheath near the small joints, particularly the fingers. 
They can occur over a wide age range, but are most common in the third and fourth decade, with the female predominance. Characteristic features include multilobulated growth, dense fibrosis, foamy histiocytes, and hemosiderant deposition. The giant cells themselves are not neoplastic and are recruited by the mononuclear tumor cells. Mitotic activity can be relatively high but this on its own should not be concerning for malignant transformation. In this case, you could see that the giant cells were not numerous and there was minimal hemosiderin deposition. To give you a better sense of the morphologic spectrum of this tumor, I'm going to show a couple more examples. In this example, we still have multilobulated growth and dense fibrosis. However, even at low power, you can see that the giant cells are larger and more numerous than the previous example. In this example, you can see cleft-like spaces forming pseudopapillary type structures. This is another feature that can be seen in tenosynovial giant cell tumor. In addition, there is abundant hemosiderin deposition. Often, the hemosiderin likes to accumulate in mononuclear tumor cells around the periphery these are referred to as ladybug or ladybird cells. So far, I've only talked about localized tenosynovial giant cell tumor. However, there is also a diffuse type. This type commonly arises in the large joints and carries a risk of significant morbidity since negative margins can be difficult to obtain. Both the localized and diffuse types of tenosynovial giant cell tumor have balanced translocations involving the chromosomal region of 1p13, which includes the CSF1 gene. Overexpression of CSF1 by tumor cells is what is thought to cause the recruitment of osteoclast-like giant cells. There are also giant cell tumors arising in the soft tissue and bone, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those. Giant cell tumor of soft tissue arises in the superficial soft tissues, most commonly in the arm, thigh, and calf. They may also have a rim of peripheral ossification, so myositis ossificans, which I talked about in a previous video, may enter the differential based on the imaging findings. These lesions do not have any characteristic molecular alterations. Giant cell tumor of bone usually arises in the epiphyseal region of long bones, but may extend into the adjacent soft tissues. However, this is not a feature of malignancy for these lesions. These tumors also have a characteristic mutation in histone H3.3, with over 90% having the G34W point mutation. And that's all I have for now. If you would like to learn more about giant cell tumor of bone, I provided a link to a thread I posted on Twitter a while back in the video description. You can also check out my Pathology Mega Index, which is a list of all my educational posts and videos. Please like and subscribe and stay tuned for my next video. Thanks for watching.